1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. Vidcast 3... Ooh, what is it? 12. 312 for April 2nd, 2010. I thought it was 311 for a moment. And yes, we it's April... We did 311. The show's for April 2nd, even though for those of you in, U in the U.S., it's April 1st. But because we're coordinating Universal time here, it's April 2nd. So, no April Fool's jokes, although we did have some good ideas. We were going to have Calf open the show. Yeah. And he Actually, was going to do... we were also going to open the show with neither one of us here. Like as if we just forgot. <laughs> just roll the no, opening no, light. Yeah, no computers, chairs. no nothing. Yep. Just like, oops, one of the lights on. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've had some good ideas, but uh, no, none of that. It is April 2nd. We do it uh, by coordinating Universal Time. We've got a really great show tonight. Ed Buckby is going to be on the show a little bit later on. Uh, but first, a uh, couple things. Yuri's Night is not that far away. We're, what, like a week away from Yuri's Night? Yeah, April, yeah. yeah. It's Well, it's April 12th, but the main parties are going on the weekend prior to that, which is April 10th and 11th. Um, and we will be on mm -hmm. for all of April 10th and 11th. <laughs> well, not quite that much, but yeah, I think we've got like a 12 or 14 hour video, live worldwide video cast. Yep. And this truly is going to be worldwide. We're going to be going all across different time zones across the planet and doing live video streaming from these different parties uh, for Yuri's Night. Awesome. And we've got some really cool surprises in store for you. I can't talk about them quite yet, but I got to tell you, this thing is going to be awesome. Yeah. We also have, just to show you how widespread and wide reaching this is, we have a quick Yuri's promo video. This is this is one of the videos that you can, this is actually, this isn't even the full video. No. You can download, the, download mm -hmm. these on the Yuri's um, iTunes channel. Yep. And uh, this is just one minute from the South Pole URI section. So check this out. So cool. Hi, my name is Mel McMahon, and I'm the station manager here at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station for the winter of 2010. It's an absolute honor for me to be able to kick off Yuri's Night for 2010 here at the bottom of the world. Um, I wasn't around when Yuri made that first flight, and I still hadn't been born when we first set foot on the moon either, but at the age of five, I had a basic understanding of what we were doing when we set the first shuttle up. And since then, the image of that shuttle has stood as a symbol to me for what we can accomplish when we put our minds to it personally as inspiration for all my own travels and adventures, which eventually took me down here. And so that's just one minute of that clip. That's that's from the South Pole. The South Pole. That's they were the like, yeah, it's negative 70 outside. I'm like, yeah. oh, I know what that feels like. That's really cold. And that, I, I happen to have some inside information as to where <laughs> all of the, uh, some of the videos are going to come from. That's mm -hmm. not even the coolest location. You guys are going to have to watch the live It is probably the that. coldest, though. Uh, no, it is not. Oh, you're right. Okay, yep. it's one of the coldest. One of the coldest, though. Uh, the, you can get more information on Yuri's Night at yurisnight.net. And that's, for those who don't know, if you're a space noob, it's uh, Yuri Gagarin, who is the first man in space. So we're celebrating the first time humans made it into space. Awesome. And speaking of humans going oh, into wait, space. Oh, wait, really quickly? If you're on Twitter? It was such a great segue. I know, but really I mean, quickly. Like, I know, I know, I know. But if you're on Twitter, it's hashtag YN2010. So you can follow that as well. And the segue's broken. So I'm just going to say, you know what? 
STS-131, about a week away, <laughs> April 5th, live coverage right here, high definition. Check out our preview. April 5th, 2010, right here, spacevidcast.com, the only place you can get live, high-definition coverage of space shuttle launches on the internet. That is going to be very, very cool. In addition, we have got roaming reporters down at Kennedy Space Center who will be able to answer your questions live in real time. They're going to be bringing astronauts on. They're going to be bringing people involved in the actual launch on. And right in our own chat room, you can ask your questions directly of them or by using the hashtag spacevidcast on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Our guest tonight has been associated with the U.S. space program for over four decades. His career began in 1959 when America's first Mercury astronauts were selected. As a NASA public affairs officer, Ed met and worked with all of the astronauts who flew in the early Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. In 1970, Ed was selected by rocket legend Werner von Braun to be the uh, first director of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Ed is also the visionary who assembled and managed the world's largest space and rocket exhibition, as well as founded the U.S. Space Camp and Aviation Challenge programs. Over half a million students and teachers from 70 countries have been inspired and motivated by attending one of the programs Ed has created. Ed Buckby, welcome to Space Vidcast, and uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, what got you into the space program originally? You've, you've You've been there for over four decades now, or at least associated with it for over four decades. Well, I came out of a, a university, West Virginia University, as a uh, an ROTC student. I was a, a lieutenant in the Army, and they uh, they shipped me to Redstone Arsenal, uh, Alabama, and I uh, I began to engage with uh, guys I was living with in the in the bachelor officer quarters and and the, these were uh, young engineers my age uh, and all of a sudden they were working in in the missile business and I was a journalism major and my job has always been related to the press and media and speech writing and so forth so I, I sort of got hooked and and decided to leave the uh, army career behind and I joined NASA uh, in officially in 1961 I went to work with Von Brown and in the rocket team and you know I, I was just lucky to be at that location at that time because that was the beginning of uh, President Kennedy's commitment of uh, going to the moon in this decade and and return our astronauts safely and I was on the ground floor so to speak of that very early Saturn program and watched that thing develop all those years and then and continued uh, that job until about 1970 when I was asked to be the museum director, and, and I got to go to space camp uh, every day for uh, about 25 years. <laughs> so I had a, had a fun time, uh, uh, you know, not, not only marketing the space program officially with NASA, but then coming out and, and opening the museum and the space center and, and space camp and continuing to communicate that, that, that great uh, story to, to the rest of the world. Now, you you'd mentioned a little bit earlier that you worked with Von Braun, and, and it seems like you worked with him quite a bit, or at least 
Um, there was a bit of interaction. In fact, in your book, uh, The Real Space Cowboys, which is uh, why we've got you on tonight from Apogee Books, which you can get at apogeebooks.com, uh, there's an entire chapter dedicated to Von Braun. Could you describe him a little bit? Or what was it like? Because he's a legend in the industry. I mean, the, the, the biggest, baddest, most awesomest rockets in the world are at his hand. I, what was it like working next to him or beside him or with him? You know, he was... He was a great uh, boss. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, very intelligent, uh, extremely bright, uh, able to uh, not only manage the Saturn program coast to coast, but also have a vision for the future. And he was constantly thinking about how we could do uh, bigger and better things beyond the moon. And as as you know, working for him, uh, you know, we were constantly impressed with this man born in a foreign country, able to come here, uh, ad ad adapt to our uh, political system, uh, understand our, uh, our engineering processes, uh, work with our industry, and, and build these one-of-a-kind space vehicles that, that took our guys you know, to the moon. Uh, he was, he was, it was fun to be around. He had a, a great sense of humor. Uh, he, he was never, uh, what you would say, down. He, he, he believed that uh, his people could produce uh, these, these vehicles uh, correctly, and, and, and we, we tested them in Huntsville, and then we shipped them to the Cape, and, and we launched them. And he was, you know, he was one of those guys who, who truly believed uh, that we had this capability, very unique capability, and if properly managed and, 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 and deployed, we could do this. We could, we could beat the Russians to the moon, and that was really our charge, as you know, uh, uh, President Kennedy gave gave them America that charge to beat the Russians to the moon. We were in truly in a race. It was almost like a wartime situation. Uh, working uh, with von Braun and the, and the rocket team, putting together this machine and making sure we beat the Russians to the moon within the decade. And we did that. And as you know, the Russians basically stopped and never really attempted a, a, a manned landing. And uh, so. That was that was a wonderful time to be associated with uh, rocket engineers, and you know he is a legend. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, a, 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 not a day goes by that I don't I don't think of something that he caused or he influenced. Certainly in this town, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Rocket City, USA, he has left his his certainly left his mark. And there's a lot of people here who worked uh, under him. That are still active and, and and are working on the new programs and so forth that we're we're presently involved with. And he was he was fun to be around. Uh, he used to say uh, about the program, uh, "No bucks, uh, no Buck Rogers," and that meant that he had to go to Washington to get the bucks so that we would have an opportunity to really be involved in Buck Rogers activities. And we had some fun projects uh, from the Saturn V, uh, including the lunar rovering vehicle that we put on the moon for the astronauts to drive. And, and in fact, Von Brown was planning a Mars mission and, and in fact laid that out very c clearly to the administration uh, right after uh, Armstrong returned from his flight and, and the Apollo 11 crew. In August of 1969, Von Brown laid out that plan uh, to the Space Task Force uh, in Washington. Unfortunately, no one was interested and it, it fell to the wayside. But he was going to use a modified Saturn V rocket with a nuclear upper stage and we would fly two of those uh, on a Mars mission with six, six guys, six gals on board and be able to accomplish that by 1985. And that was uh, the, sort of his, his the dream that he had uh, after going to the moon to continue that type of manned flight uh, to Mars. Hmm. So what happened there? Uh, you know, obviously we haven't put humans on Mars yet, uh, and certainly it's a little bit political and it's a little bit of everything, but where, where did the motivation die down? Was it because we were racing the, with the Russians to the moon and we beat them, so we win, that's yeah. it, we're Game done? Game over. Uh, you know, why didn't we make it to the, uh, Mars? You know, that's that's part of the problem. We 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 beat we won the race. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no competition, uh, and you have to you have to recall in the late '60s, uh, w this country was going through uh, a lot of uh, social uh, upheaval. Uh, we were in the the Vietnam situation, and, and people were you know were tired of that war. And I think I think 
we did not really have the leadership. Uh, once uh, Kennedy, uh, unfortunately, was assassinated, and then Johnson, who, by the way, uh, should be credited with picking up the whole initiative that Kennedy had had developed, and that was continued the moon flight. And, and a lot of us were concerned when uh, the president was assassinated that this whole effort might go down the tubes, we mm-hmm. might just stop. But, you know, Johnson should be credited with the fact he continued many of Kennedy's programs. But after that, after Johnson uh, left public office, there was really no leader who stepped up and said, we need to continue uh, manned spaceflight. And we we had that gap uh, for quite some time until shuttle came along. And uh, as you know, shuttle was developed strictly to operate in Earth orbit. And the Air Force needed the vehicle, and NASA needed the vehicle, so we have a special vehicle that was designed only for Earth orbital activities. So consequently, anything beyond Earth orbit was not available to us, and and we haven't been out of Earth orbit since 1972, which is is disappointing to many of us. So, you know, I I think one of the things that we lack is a a challenge, and, and this country loves the challenge. And I think, you know, the Chinese may be that challenge, uh, especially if people begin to understand that the Chinese are very serious about landing on the moon Mm -hmm. and controlling their assets. And and I should say, can control many of our assets that we have in Earth orbit from the moon surface. So there's a lot of concern in my in my community, in my world anyway, of what's NASA going to do about the moon? Are, are we going to the moon to look after our assets that we have in Earth orbit and also to develop a, a permanent base on the moon? We think that's a good idea and we think that's important. Whoever controls the high ground has some power, uh, certainly in this, in this world and certainly in the technology field. So we look at the moon, uh, and certainly in our world here, as the high ground and we think we need to be there. The U.S. needs to have a presence on the moon and not only to look after our, our resources that we have in Earth orbit, but also to develop a, a test program and, and do a lot of uh, exciting work in that hostile environment that might improve our opportunities to go to other places such as Mars. So we think the moon is important as a, as a, as a stepping stone to other uh, ventures out into space and also to look after our assets that we have in Earth orbit. Yes, but with the proposed fiscal year 2011 budget, the moon's kind of out. Uh, you know, while we're moving, certainly trying to move to um, commercial ventures like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the likes, uh, as far as I know, none of them have a heavy lifter capable of going to the moon. That would be more of a constellation, you know, Ares 5 architecture, right. you know, the marriage between Ares 1 and Ares 5. But even if you dumped Ares 1, you could do it with a Delta IV Heavy and an Ares 5. So what now? Or, uh, what do we do without constellation? Well, that's that's a concern that uh, many of us have. Is uh, you know, I, I'm I'm certainly favorable to the private sector becoming involved in human spaceflight, especially Earth orbit. I, I really think uh, that that's a an area that, that I'd love to see them excel in. But I have to remind everyone, the private sector has only done one mission, and they, that is put a guy up at 60 miles high. And that's the extent of the private sector's ventures thus far. Uh, we did that in 1961 with Alan Shepard on a mm-hmm. modified redstone. Uh, you know, that's a long time ago to, to, to see what has happened in the private sector. I, I just don't see the private sector being mature enough at this point to be able to turn over to them responsibilities of flying our guys and gals, say, to the space station. Uh, or possibly even hiring cargo. I think that would be a good start. Give, him, give, give them the, the car- cargo responsibilities and let them fly uh, to, to the space station. As far as our, our crew members, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about uh, them having the capability of, of taking over NASA's responsibility uh, of flying astronauts to the space station. I, I think that's something that we could, we, could, we could grow into. But the, the, what what's concerns me, the first time one of those private sector rockets makes a, a black smoking hole in the desert, there's going to be a lot of people very unhappy about 
their progress. And you may very well see that entire industry go down the tubes mm -hmm. with one or two failures. That could easily happen. Uh, we've certainly had our failures in the NASA family. Uh, when you look back at Apollo 1, uh, Challenger, Columbia. But, uh, you know, we've had so many flights and we've had so many uh, opportunities to put humans in space and it's still an extremely high risk business. And I, I don't think the American public to this day uh, really appreciates the risk that those guys and gals go through to fly the shuttle uh, into Earth orbit. As, and certainly the moon landings were another level of risk that I don't think any of us in my age bracket realized how dangerous that was as well. Mm -hmm. But having said all that, uh, I still believe NASA needs to be given, uh, again, continue the responsibility for the major missions of, of flying humans in space. Uh, and, and I think that needs to continue with, uh, with the NASA family until we see maturity in the private sector. And, and I think NASA wants to see that happen. I think the NASA people that I, that I communicate with want to see the, the private sector come along. Mm -hmm. But this, this particular uh, action that's in front of us today is not the way to do it. Uh, not to shut down a complete program that's been underway for quite some time. And we've flown Ares 1X successfully just like we did the Saturn V with a, a live booster and a dummy upper stage in 1961. Mm -hmm. We followed the same procedure. We took that old Saturn I and we slowly, with the building block concept, flew that, that vehicle about 10 times unmanned to learn about the whole idea of this new multi-stage, multi-engine concept. And that's how we eventually got to the Saturn V moon rocket. And, that, and that's what NASA's been trying to do with the Ares, use the Ares as a test flight vehicle that will lead us to a new manned vehicle with a, a flight safety system, uh, an escape system that we haven't had on the shuttle, and eventually develop the Ares 5 that would take us out of Earth orbit back to the, to the, to the, to the moon, certainly, and to the planets. And we need that uh, development to come right along behind the Ares 1. Awesome. When we were speaking, uh, well, you and Ben were speaking yesterday a little bit as we were doing our, our testing for this uh, interview. Uh, you had mentioned a different project that isn't, uh, it's, unfortunately, it's not on Apogee, uh, but the project, it's uh, 50 years of rockets and spacecraft, if, if I remember correctly, the uh, Werner von Braun. Yes. They were letters back and forth? Yes. Um, There's two things that I've, I've worked on. One is this 50th uh, 50 Years of Rockets and Spacecraft, which uh, I believe it's, it's this, this is the cover. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and it's, it's basically a Von Braun's story uh, based in Huntsville, Alabama, the, uh, the 50 Years of Rockets and Spacecraft, which he started uh, uh, here and is, is continued at the Marshall Space Flight Center. So it's a history uh, of the Marshall Center. And from, from Alan Shepard's first flight on the Mercury Redstone right all the way through the shuttle and the International Space Station, all of those programs, of course, the Huntsville team have had some involvement with. The other thing that I'm, I've just finished, and it will be coming out on a DVD uh, in about 30 days, it's uh, called Von Braun, the Rocket Man. Mm -hmm. And it has in the DVD over 10,000 of his personal notes. And those notes represent his, his work from 1961 through 1969. Every one of his managers, about approximately 20, 20 guys or gals, uh, on Friday would send him a one-pager <laughs> of what they had accomplished that week. Okay. He would take those home on the weekend and read every word. And then he would write on the margin, uh, great job, uh, do you need my help on this? Uh, why is that uh, that engine behind schedule? And it was it was his personal email, you might say. He, right. If he were here today, he would have he would be tweeting, he would be texting. He was the kind of guy that loved gadgets and communicate with people. So this was this was Von Brown. This is really his email right. of of the '60s. And so I, I've I've been fortunate to be able to go back through all of those those uh, one pagers and I've, I've read most of them not every word but I've read most especially the ones that he wrote comments on mm -hmm. and that's going to be uh, put on this uh, DVD that's coming out in about 30 days and uh, it'll be available on my website uh, 
www.air-space.com and, and, and I don't know and, and possibly uh, Apogee as well I, I can't verify that yet but they may very well have that as well but it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting piece of work because we have about a 25 minute uh, video and it's, it's about Von Braun and I interviewed I interviewed his secretary from Germany and his secretary that worked for him in the U.S. for 20 years, wow. and two of his special assistants that worked for him and, and worked on these, these future projects, mm -hmm. and the lady who handled his international correspondence. So I interviewed all of them and talked about you know the man von Braun, the crusader for space, the boss, the the father and and you know all of the things that you would want to know about him and it's 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 an interesting uh, look at this this man who you know unfortunately he passed away at the age of 65 mm -hmm. and he was just so full of energy and and, and new ideas of uh, wanting to use in space for other things that we hadn't even had an opportunity to, to investigate mm -hmm. but anyway the, the, it's it's a story about him and how he managed his uh, his rocket team and the way he communicated with people. So that I'm, I'm looking forward to having it out in about a month. That's very cool. Now, just out of curiosity, kind of going back a little bit, do you think that the, um, the privatized space or the new space that's up and coming that, like you said, maybe n isn't as mature as what NASA is, do you think they could learn something from the way that Von Braun communicated? And, you know, it, does that make any sense from these letters? Oh, no question about that. Yeah, for example, he would give a problem to two different organizations, okay. and he would have two possible solutions. Mm. And little things like that that we learn from Von Braun and, and are still uh, used in, in the development of rocketry here in, in, the, in the Rocket City, a lot of those things came from him. And the other thing that he truly believed in is you must test every component of a machine if you're going to call it man-rated. Mm -hmm. And that means starting off with... with the, the, you know the the bolt and you test that and then when you assemble the bolt to the next component you test that and that's called sub testing and you go all the way through until you get to the entire system and then you test that not many people realize the fact that we tested ground tested every rocket stage that was on the Saturn V and flown to the moon uh, so let's steer this in a slightly different direction when you first came on the show uh, the chat room went crazy a buzz as it were with uh, space camp you're talking about space camp uh, last week's guest, Robert Perlman, has gone to space camp at least six times mm -hmm. and has certainly been inspired by what he saw and was able to do at space camp. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us, uh, how did space camp get started? I mean, it wasn't just like, hey, let's build space camp. It started kind of as a test, did it not? It did. You know, it's, it's, it goes back to Von Braun. Uh, he, he's the guy who really created uh, the museum that I, I was working at. Yeah. And he had come back to visit one day and we were walking through the rocket park down the length of the Saturn V and there was a, a, a group of students and a teacher there walking around and they were uh, looking at the rocket engines and they were taking notes and he asked me what was going on I said well this is a, a, a visiting school group we call it the yellow school bus tour and, and they'll be here probably until mid-afternoon and then we'll, they'll go home and, he, and I said they'll have their field day uh, here at the Space Center and he said, uh, do you think they get, uh, they get anything out of that? I said, yes, sir, I, I believe they do. I, I think they enjoy it, but I, I, I also believe they would love to climb in that spacecraft over there or put on a space suit uh, and, you know, play astronaut or mm -hmm. play rocket scientist for a minute. And he looked at me, and he, he, he kind of looked at the youngsters there for a moment. He said, you know, we have all kinds of camps in this country. We have uh, football camps. We have band camps and cheerleading camps. Why don't we have some kind of a science camp? And he says, you know, we need to share with this next generation uh, this experience that we're having, and, and we let them. We, we need to let them touch it, let them come in and feel what it's like to be a part of it. And that was the beginning of what later became Space Camp. At awesome. the time, it, we called it Science Camp, and we we studied it. And and in fact, uh, we didn't do anything with it until about 1979, 1980. And then I grabbed, I gathered all my my kids. I had a couple of daughters, uh, young age, at middle school, and all the neighborhood kids. And we put them in two vans and brought them out to the museum with their sleeping bags. And that weekend, we played Space Camper in the museum with my, the neighborhood kids playing 
astronaut uh, eating space food, climbing in the spacecraft. We, uh, this, the, the curator would have gone crazy if he had seen what, that we were climbing around in the Apollo 16 <laughs> command module that oh had been to the goodness. moon. We were holding the moon rock, passing <laughs> around. So I'm sure I would have been uh, apprehended and, and you know, t taken away if they had known all that was happening. But we found out that weekend that that was a super, super idea that that's what they wanted to do. And the other thing we found out was they didn't want to come just to day camp. Mm -hmm. They wanted to come and spend the night. They oh, wanted yeah. to hang out with their buddies and stay there overnight. So we learned uh, that space camp was the, the right subject. We had the right idea that the menu was correct and they, they we just had to find a way to do it. And we started off with uh, dormitory space at the university. We even used the arsenal military uh, barracks one year. And we finally built it up uh, to a point where I was invited to a, a talk show. Uh, I think it was Good Morning America hmm. about space camp. And a couple of Hollywood uh, writers saw that interview and called me about three days later and said, we want to do a movie on space camp. And I thought, oh, this this will end it for sure. I let, you know, <laughs> once Hollywood gets a hold of it, and we can forget about our credibility. But believe it or not, that movie turned out to be a twenty million dollar commercial for hmm. space camp. We went from I think seven hundred and fifty children that summer to five thousand <gasps> the next summer, and it grew and grew and grew to where at one point we had 24,000 students a year come through a one-week space camp oh. in the 90s when it was at its peak. So the movie really uh, aid, aided us and helped us get the word out that space camp was something that was open to everyone and you could really enjoy yourself. And, you know, D Dottie Medcalf Lindenberger, who's flying on this mission, mm -hmm. As a teacher, educator, is a Space Academy graduate. Oh, cool. And we, and we have two other ladies that have uh, just br been brought into the astronaut corps who are uh, former graduates. One's a, a, a flight surgeon, and another one is a, 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 a researcher from MIT. So, wow. and, and I know of just literally hundreds of young men and women across the country that are working in some form or fashion uh, with the space program, either with a contractor, software programmer, someone, and they've been through space camp. I, I get I get gobs of emails from from people that uh, tell me that you know I I came to space camp that turned me on to science and math. I made better grades, and consequently I got a job, and so I'm really happy to be working in this field. And of course, we have a lot of them in Huntsville, Alabama who were Space Camp graduates. Oh, for you know, sure. I'll say the chat room is just going berserk right now as you're talking about Space Camp. Like, I loved Space Camp, or I just, just everything that they're saying is, is just Actually, cute. there's one woman in the chat room, a geek mom, who she went to Space Camp, and now she's willing, or she's waiting to send her child to Space Camp, and the two of them go back together. And she also that's, wants you as a neighbor. But quite popular. <laughs> yeah, it's quite popular. In fact, we have uh, almost a thousand teachers coming this summer. Oh, wow. Uh, coming to the special space teachers program that's being conducted uh, now. And so uh, it's it's branched out. And, and, of course, I had an opportunity to open a camp in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, in Belgium, uh, in Canada. And uh, we all actually went to Russia one time uh, trying to work one uh, into Russia, but it never worked out. And there's there's some interest, uh, believe it or not, in, in China, in Asia, in space camp. So it's it's still quite popular. Uh, the younger uh, guys and gals uh, overseas are, are not quite as involved in it as, as our, our young people are because we're so close to the space program here. We have the shuttle, and that helps a lot when you have your own vehicle to fly. So, you know, the missions are, are really fun at space camp because they are space, space shuttle related. And this summer they're going to add some new things. Uh, a Mar uh, I'm sorry, a moon, a moon landing, I'm told, a moon mission. And so they're going to add some new stuff. Awesome. And so, can adults go as well? Because I'm kind of itching now to oh, go. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, there's an adult program. In fact, I, I, I lecture to the adult program. And they're, 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 they're like you guys and gals. Uh, they are truly into the space program. And some of those uh, adults have been to the uh, 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 
academy, or I should say the adult academy, mm -hmm. six or seven times. Like, uh, you no, know, like Robert Pierman, uh, a lot of them have been back time and time again. And wow. so, yes, there is an adult. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, we're gonna uh, keep you on for a little while. Actually, uh, before we let you go, there, uh, we're building up our <laughs> questions. There are two questions we want to ask every guest on the show. And the first question is, uh, who is your favorite astronaut, living or dead? It'd have to be Alan Shepard. Mm. I, I worked closely with Alan uh, from the early days uh, when they became, you know, the Mercury 7, right. the cocky, egotistical, uh, gotcha guys. Uh, and I, I worked with him. And he helped me a lot, by the way, with Space Camp. Awesome. He came here numerous times. Uh, and he spoke to gradu graduating classes. Uh, he went to Japan with me to Belgium, to other places, and to, to Florida. We opened one in Florida. So he was, he, was my, uh, he was my mentor as far as the astronaut goes. Fun guy to be around. Wally Shira, his buddy, is another one that's a favorite of mine. <clears throat> and we all three had a, had a, had a great time together uh, doing the book because Wally helped me with the book. Mm -hmm. And we were going to do it with Shepard, but we lost Shepard uh, too soon, and we didn't have a mm -hmm. chance to get him. But, so we wrote about him in the book. Mm -hmm. It's kind of uh, kind of dedicated the book to him. Yeah, but they are they were they were the real uh, they were the real space cowboys and and they really you know played that role early on, having the uh, having been moved to Houston and you know set up there and and it, so it, it turned out to be uh, we picked up that real space cowboy title and we uh, we used that all those years and I love it. And Shepard uh, was always the one you know when and space campers would ask him. Um, <clears throat> how did you become the first astronaut to fly in space? Mm -hmm. And, of course, Shepard would say, because I was the best. <laughs> and if Wally Shira was in the audience, he would say, that's not true. It's because NASA ran out of monkeys. <laughs> and so we would get a big laugh out of that. And uh, But they were they were fun to be around because they were always uh, doing gotchas on each other and pulling jokes and so forth. And So we, uh, I, I really have to say Shepard would be my favorite Um the other, another moonwalker that I have a lot of regard for and work with is uh, Gene Cernan, mm. uh, Last Man to Walk on the Moon. Uh, he's also a, a big supporter of this type of thing, and uh, I, I enjoy uh, working with with Gene because he's he's a true believer in that we we need to go back there and and reestablish our presence uh, in space and and get on with it. And so I I have a lot of respect for for him. And of course, there's you know there's probably about uh, 20, about 30 of those astronauts that in that era, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, I think there are 32 that I work with uh, from the time I, I was in public affairs at NASA through the space camp days and so forth. And we still do reunions, and um, I, I'm the moderator of a number of uh, forums that we do with with the guys. And, and, and so it's fun to talk to them and have them back and, and have them tell their stories. So sometime maybe we can do that. Maybe get two or three of them on, on here and talk about that. There that you go. Awesome. awesome. All right. And your final question, and this is the most important one, oh, of, the, of the remaining space shuttle orbiters, which one is your favorite? <clears throat> I'd say Discovery. Hmm. I'd say Discovery is. Uh, and I, I don't know. If it's, I guess it's, a, it's the one that I've seen exciting missions from. and. Mm -hmm. uh, Kind of been up close to it and you know touched it mm. uh, when it was being built at Palmdale. Oh, I, I, I remember as it was being rolled out uh, in its final days, and, and you know it's it's nothing like seeing one of those special machines, one of a kind, that's just rolling off the line, and you know it's going to go in space someday. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that would be the the one. I, uh, and as far as the uh, moon rockets go, I. I would uh, I'd pick uh, Apollo 17 because <clears throat> I had my entire family uh, at the Cape that night when Gene and his crew lifted off. And Apollo 17 was a night launch, and that was spectacular. And I had my whole family there uh, to see that, and that, uh, all my daughters and um, my wife and, and even our dog. So that's, that's, that's a memorable, memorable uh, launch, and I, I guess I, I've probably seen... 20, I, don't, I don't know, 25 uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo flights, and, you know, probably 
15 or 20 shuttle flights over the wow. years. But it's still a, a, an experience for me to, to see a, a machine like that lift off at Kennedy Space Center with with people on board it's it's, it's it, I never grow weary of watching that it's always it's always a special feeling and you f you feel like the country is doing something very very special mm -hmm. every time i see one all right wow, and stay with awesome. us uh, we're going to we're going to wrap up the recorded part of the show we're going to go into post show in just a moment and uh, when we go into post show i want to ask you a little bit more about experiencing a saturn 5 launch because i was not born when the saturn 5 ever took off yeah. and i would love I'd love to hear what that was like because I've seen the shuttle, but okay. I, and that's a powerful experience. But I can only imagine the Saturn V. So Ed, thank you very much for joining us, <clears throat> and we'll be back with you in just a few minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. For everyone else, you didn't know it, but we were running a contest for this show. Yep. See, if you retweeted out and you actually said, "Hey, Space Vidcast is doing a show." you automatically became eligible to win a copy of Ed's book, The Real Space Cowboys by Apogee Books. Which is awesome. Which is awesome. It comes with a uh, uh, DVD in the back. Of course, always. Yep, oops, and it comes with an Apogee Books catalog. Yep, there you go. <laughs> so, The Real there Space Cowboys, and Karen, who, who do we have as a winner? Because my screen's all borked up. Oh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I thought you were doing it. So, well, you're was, just going to have to stall now it. for a moment. Uh, now, for those who don't win, you can go to apogeebooks.com and you can buy this book. And uh, a lot of what we talked about tonight is in this book, and it, he, he has some great interviews uh, in here. And oh, actually, look at that. I even opened up to a picture of uh, uh, Von Braun right there. Not that you will be able to see it this far away, but there you go. And he's got a lot of information on Von Braun and uh, all of the different astronauts from Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and uh, some just some great stuff inside of this book. And the winner is... Do, 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 do. There. Deadly Duck. Right? Sure, why not? That's where your finger ended. That so, is where it ended. Uh, we'll tweet that back out, make sure that Deadly Duck knows that he won The Real Space Cowboys by Ed Buckby. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. What helps make this show go, as well as our live co coverage of STS-131, I almost said 134, 131, <laughs> one of the final four remaining space shuttle missions, is something called Space Vidcast Epic. That is a paid version of Space Vidcast. It helps us pay the bills, allows us to buy new lamps. You'll notice we have the entire blue lit up this week. That's right, absolutely. And it helps me buy new iPads when they come out on April 3rd. And you can get that at uh, spacevidcast.com slash epic. Here's a quick promo video. spacefigcast.com slash epic. It starts at $8.33 per month uh, if you do a yearly uh, subscription or $10 a month for a monthly subscription. And uh, like I said, it helps us keep the lights on and produce these awesome shows for you guys. Oh, by the way, sounds like we are going to be able to go to ISDC. Not all the details are worked out quite yet, but that's looking better than well, it was a week ago. news to me, but yay. Yeah, it's, it's news <laughs> to you. And um, we're, like, we're going to have the live co coverage of 134 and live coverage for Yuri's Night. So all those events are coming up shortly. I mean, so 131. 131. I knew I was going to say 134. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see you guys uh, April 4th into the 5th for the launch of STS-131. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.